Well, I think that they can be a little bit different. Now, one of the issues that we have in the field of learning and development is that all of our terminology, all of our language and labels is not consistent. There is no authority body that has established this is the term, this is what it means, no kidding, no, no deviations. So we have that kind of an issue. But social learning, is, to me, is learning that's facilitated by somebody else. So generally, that person is called a coach. And they may do coaching of one or more um, individuals, learners. Sorry. Uh, and collaborative learning then is similar. But to me, it can be when a group is getting together, attempting to learn something, and they're collaborating in their determining, you know, what information is there and how it might apply to their situation. Now, that, that might be facilitated by a coach or an instructor, or a mentor, or whatever title you might want to give that, or they may be on their own. So these are just different means to the ends of learning, hopefully to the ends of performance. Yes, let me establish a little context for that, because I have, uh, since the early 80s, when I became a consultant, an instructional systems design consultant, I, I always framed uh, the three different modes for instruction, uh, group-paced, coached, and self-paced. Um, and so there are people who say that, you know, all learning is social, but, but, but what I'm gravitating to is the coached uh, mode for instruction. And this is what would some people consider to be the 20 in the 70-20-10 reference model. I uh, flip that to be 10, 20, 70, but, but in any event, it's, the, it's that thing that's not the formal learning and it's not the uh, informal learning. It's something that's kind of sits in the middle. And the continuum for me is for social learning, and this relates to uh, one of my uh, recent books, Structured Social Learning, is that there's a continuum and on one far end, there's informal and unstructured social learning. And on the far end of the extreme is uh, highly formal and highly structured social learning. So an example of the informal is if your child uh, has a flat tire on the bike and you want to uh, guide them through fixing the flat tire, you know, taking the wheel off the bike and doing all of that and fixing the flat itself and then putting it back on the bike without any guidance or anything, that's kind of informal. There's no structure to it. You're making it up as you go. Um, and if the child struggles with any particular part, you give them additional guidance. Um, on the other side, if you were changing the flat tire for a, uh, a dirt bike that's going to be in a race or a race car at uh, the Indianapolis 500 or Le Mans, you know, that's there's going to be more structure to how you uh, teach someone how they learn how to do that because uh, of the criticality and the stakes and all that. So when there's no guidance for the coach in the structured learning context, um, that's what I think is on that far end of the continuum where it's very informal, there is no structure. But you can give a coach a highly structured set of guidelines for them to conduct the social learning. And that might include you know, an outline with objectives, and it might have quiz questions or performance tests that you ask somebody to go through to check whether or not something has been learned adequately or not. So again, it's all over the, the continuum, and, you know, it, so it always depends on what's appropriate uh, in, in a learning context. Yeah, so the uh, both self-paced and group-paced can be structured, highly structured or loosely structured. And there can always be a blend of these things. But, but for coached learning or what I call uh, structured social learning, which which back in the day used to be uh, on-the-job training, you know, highly structured or no structure, or an apprenticeship program, highly structured or no structure. So. The, the choice of, of determining whether or not you're going to have 
a, a, some structure or a lot of structure has to do with the risks and the w rewards at stake. And this also goes uh, in, incorporates, in my thinking, uh, a model that uh, I got from problem solving courses back in the 1970s, where you would look at the significance of something and its likelihood. So you would look at the risks and rewards and decide, are they significant? Or are they you know, uh, low stakes, medium stakes, high stakes? And how likely is that to happen? Especially on the risk side, you know, uh, uh, we could have something that's extremely risky, extremely dangerous. People could lose life or limb. And so that's high, high stakes performance. And therefore, if they're learning to do something, I would want to provide more structure as a risk mitigation strategy or tactic and make sure that the coach, you know, has a checklist of, you know, talk about this, talk about that, talk about this other thing, have them do this, have them demonstrate this in front of you. Oh, by the way, here's your criteria for what you're looking at as a coach and make sure you don't forget anything and that the learner doesn't forget anything. And maybe it includes additional practice with feedback, et cetera. And so, it all depends on the risks and the rewards at stake and how likely they are, they are to happen. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm, I remind, or I'm reminded of, of a chat we had last time and you spoke about, I, I really liked your example of, I think it was an airplane pilot um, and how, I'd, I'd love, if you, love it if you can walk me through that example that you have. Well, uh, those of us who have flown airplanes, and uh, as a consultant, I've flown plenty. Um, if you've ever sat in a window seat, you might have noticed before takeoff is that there's the pilot or somebody in a uniform is walking around and checking out the underbelly of the aircraft. And sometimes you can see this on the plane next to your plane. And they usually have a clipboard or something in their hand, and they are going through a checklist. And that checklist is there to make sure that they don't forget to check this or check that and check, you know, whatever dozens of things that they're looking for. Now, in a high stakes situation like a pilot flying an airplane with hundreds of people on board, that's high risk. And they, their job of checking out the underbelly of the aircraft, looking for whatever there is they're looking, because I really don't know, um, is significant. And so most likely they were trained on what to look for. And the checklist is simply a prompt, a reminder to guide their performance so that they don't forget to look at something. Now, they need to have been trained on, on exactly what to look for. But there's lower risk situations where there may be a checklist and we just gave it to somebody and we didn't give them any instruction because we thought that their prior knowledge coming into that situation was sufficient, either through education or experience, or the checklist is so crystal clear and the tasks to be performed are so simple that training, instruction, learning isn't necessary uh, to the ends of performance. Well, there's, uh, I, you know, so uh, using a coach and all that requires you know, setting up a system of sorts, you know, and, and identifying coaches and have them ready to, you know, assist the learner whenever that's needed. So sometimes we don't need that. We can just give people self-paced. We can give them a magazine article to read, uh, PDF online, uh, e-learning, uh, watching audio uh, uh, and video presentation, or just listen to an audio podcast. And so we can remove the... Uh, the friction in that by letting the learner access that or send it to them, so push or pull, and they can take that and stop it and start it and do all those kinds of things when they want to. Um, and so when it's when that's the route to go, that's cheaper, usually from a development standpoint and from a delivery standpoint. And so that's when you would want to do that. You use a coach um, in structured social learning when you need to answer questions that the learner might have. And where is an, a video that you watch may not do that. Now, we can use chat boxes and things like that, chat bots, to answer some of those questions if we have anticipated those questions and programmed it to do so. But sometimes we just need that one-on-one -on -one 
or one on a small group or the coach to do that. There's other cases where the performance that we're trying to train somebody on might involve many different players. Uh, for example, if you're trying to train product managers to run product team meetings, you may want to have them go through what I call simulation exercises where they actually prepare for a meeting and conduct a meeting and you need people from engineering and manufacturing and sales and support groups or whatever the right configuration is and have them all play roles and make it a little bit uh, challenging for me, the product manager, to facilitate that kind of a meeting. And and so therefore, you know, coaching doesn't have enough people involved to actually simulate, replicate the authentic performance that's required. And I think, you know, what's best for learning is it for it to be as authentic as possible without it being dangerous. So we may back off authenticity and simulate performance as close as we can so that the learner experiences that builds their competence and their confidence so that they can go back to the job and perform. So sometimes the performance requires more people than a, than a coaching mode, the social structured learning mode might provide. Cool. Uh, I have a, a, a bit of a, an off topic question um, and, and I, I didn't send that to you before. So feel free to, to, to let me know if you'd like to answer it at, at a different time. Sure. Go ahead. Um, but so you def you describe you know in a in a structured social learning context it's it's facilitated by you know a coach or by someone who is knowledgeable and provides that structure um with the rise of cohort based cohort based courses like the one we're running at eduflow academy um we provide a structured experience but there isn't a, a direct um synchronous facilitation happening um, in the con in the case of uh, you know a no live facilitation, is there a substitute for uh, you know the, the the structure or the the thing or the person providing a structure? Can a structure be just a process that is very well thought out? Well, I think so. In that it's asynchronous, and just like we used to play telephone tag and call each other, leave each other messages, calls the person calls back, leaves that person a message, and back and forth. <laughs> you can do the same thing with modern technology, and it does not have to be synchronous. If I have a question, I should be able to leave uh, my question with the coach, and they can get back to me whether I'm there to capture it live synchronously or not. Um, sometimes it's better because I may have follow-on questions, and this just elongates that whole process where I wasn't really sure about your answer, and so I have a clarifying question, a follow-up, and that just takes more time. But So you fit the, the situational realities, the, what's feasible in that, and the world has been working asynchronously for a long time. Not everything has to be done synchronous. If we can, we should. But there's a cost to making everything synchronous, and, and it's a flexibility issue also. So all of that has to be balanced when you look at, you know, the, the performance that you're trying to address through learning um, and the situational realities of all the participants, the, the coach or facilitator, and all of the participants, the learners. So the organizational design issue is really about what are the processes and what are the roles and responsibilities of people in the processes. So that has to be clear. If you're going to have coaches assigned, then you need to make sure that they have the time to do that. If you simply add to somebody's burden, hey, you're going to be a coach as well. So, you know, answer those people's calls when they when they call you or when they try to arrange meetings. And if the person is already busy and has a full schedule, that's just burdening them. So organization design comes into play when we when we forecast what's the burden of the normal workday for somebody and this on top of it. And how do we carve out time for that coach to play that role? And if we don't do that, it's not going to work out very smoothly. And push comes to shove, they're probably going to do their job and not so well at the coaching. They're going to give me a short shrift answer that really doesn't answer me, doesn't really help me. And it's like we're all pretending that this is all going to work. So 
Um, and the learners themselves have to be given time out of their normal work days to do this as well. So this is an organizational design and the design of the processes and understanding them and how they interact and what the burden is on all the roles. And if we have to take some responsibilities away from some people um, in order to free up their time to play these roles, then that's what's got to be done. And unfortunately, that's not always done in a kind of a top-down manner, um, where at least the, what's cascaded down is the requirements to you know reorganize to make that happen well. Um, usually, it's a one-off thing where every department or supervisor or person that's a coach or the learners, they're all kind of figuring this out. And so, so it doesn't always work smoothly. But a lot of that would depend on the culture. So if there's a well-honed culture in place that values learning, values supporting other people uh, and mentoring or coaching them, then that's less of an issue. But I think that that's not as prevalent as we might wish it to be. On the instructional systems design level, um, I, I, this is where we have to, we can build a process and tools and templates so that it makes the uh, process for developing structured social learning or structured coaching or structured apprenticeships, or again, whatever you wanna call these things, um, we can speed that up. We can make that quicker and easier. What we have to be careful at all times uh, is the coach, if they're an expert, uh, we shouldn't pretend that they are fully capable of giving the learner exactly what they need. Now, there's this non-conscious nature of knowledge. And a, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, uh, Professor Emeritus from the University of Southern California, has been studying this for over 25 years. And what the research shows that he and others have done is that about 70% of what we all do, experts or non-experts, when we are doing work and making decisions about what we're doing and how we're doing it, 70% uh, of that is non-conscious. And I can't tell you, you can't tell me, it's just not there. And so, and then if there's a procedural behavioral tasks that we're doing that are observable, because the other thing is, you know, we can't observe cognitive tasks, but even when I'm telling you about the step-by-step -step things that I do, I'm going to miss up to 35% of them because it's I've automated all of that and it's not available to me. It's non-conscious knowledge. And so if I'm a coach and trying to you know, share with somebody, teach somebody to do something, I'm going to be missing that. Now, I can do it myself, but if I'm explaining it to somebody else, and when we're uh, as ISDers or instructional designers or learning experience designers, when we are working with a subject matter expert or master performer, as I prefer, um, we have to be conscious and wary of the fact that we're not going to get everything. We may get accurate information, we may get appropriate information, but it's not going to be complete. And so it behooves us and our processes, and this is a leadership issue, to make sure the processes are in place to talk to more than one expert to get the content that we need because the expert is going to be missing 70%. Now, the good news, according to Dr. Clark, is that every expert has knows a different 30% or is for, you know, it, what the 70% that's not available to them is different expert to expert to expert. And so after about five experts, you get about 85% of what a novice needs in order to perform. So when we assign a coach to do the coaching and leave it up to them on their own and ask them to create this structure that we want, um, the outline, the objectives, the content, the demonstrations, the exercise, practice exercises, the testing that they might do. When we rely on them to create that all, it's going to be partial. It's not going to be complete. And that'll force the learner then from formal learning into informal learning, uh, which is basically trial and error learning. Now, they may go ask their neighbor, uh, unstructured social learning, but that neighbor or whoever is going to also have that same issue where 70% of the decisions that they make are going to be non-conscious. So again, that's going to force me back into informal learning, trial and error learning. And ultimately, that might be effective, but it's certainly not efficient. So ISD folks, learning and development professionals, can help 
gather all the right information, get their content as accurate, complete, and appropriate as possible, and package that for the coaches to use in structured social learning. Well, I think it goes back to the, the, the risks and rewards at stake. And uh, back in the back in 1981, I worked at Motorola and I was working with the quality experts. And I, I learned this concept that comes from the late Philip Crosby, one of the quality gurus from back then. And it was it had to do with the cost of nonconformance and the cost of conformance. And the cost of nonconformance is the return, the R in ROI, and the cost of conformance is the I in ROI, so the return on investment. So the cost of conformance is the value of the problem or the opportunity that you face. Too often we in, in the learning, most people, lead with, well, here's what it's going to cost to fix it. So if I told you it was going to cost you a million dollars to fix it, you might go, well, that's just too much. But if I had led with the problem is worth $50 million a year, and for $1 million, we can fix that baby and be done with it for good. That means for $49 million to the good the first year, and in the second year, another $50 million. So that's $99 million over two years. Are you interested? Because that's very different. You know, if you think the cost of conformance is scary, take a look at the cost of nonconformance. Now, that, that, my example there was extreme, but but so... We need to help everyone that's involved in the decision-making process. What's the cost of the problem or the opportunity? Flip sides of the same coin, if you will. But what's that worth? And is it worth doing anything about it? And then, well, what will it cost to address that? Now you're in. You're comparing, you know, the the cost to fix something to the cost of the problem. And you know, business people look at things through a financial lens often, or they should, and they have shareholder equity that we in L&D will convert into content. And maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Maybe the things that we're addressing are worth you know, $1,000 and we're addressing them with something that's worth $1,500. And so it's a $500 loss each time. So we should be more conscious about the performance that we're targeting and what is that's worth? And if there are gaps in that performance, what are the gaps worth? Because if we can get people to be more productive, have higher quality, higher yields in their performance, whatever that performance is, um, then we can calculate that. So one of the secrets to all of this, I think, is to have a performance orientation. And by performance, I mean people are on the payroll to produce outputs. They perform tasks to resource outputs. They employ different behaviors. They need knowledge and skills to do that. But so let's forget about that for a while. For what's the thing with the output? And are we getting what we need? Uh, and so that's, that's what we really need to focus on. And then we can begin to calculate what's the value of having only a 50% yield of your outputs? You know, what's that costing us? And we need to basically start there and understand what are the requirements for the outputs and what are the current state gaps and what's that costing us. Then we can begin to look at what are the different uh, interventions that we might use to address that and mitigate that problem and either eliminate it or more likely just simply reduce the problem to something that's uh, tolerable. Cool. Uh, when you were talking about performance, I, I realized that even though it's, it's not exactly related to, to this interview, the focus of this interview, it might be a really nice opportunity to ask you to describe your philosophy, the way you think about performance um, and how, it, you know, your philosophy might have, uh, and you know, um, uh, people like Mega, um, how that philosophy was a divergence from a way that people used to think about um, education or, or, or workplace learning? Yeah, the, so I was schooled uh, my first day out of college uh, in the um, approaches and methods and thinking of the late Gary Rumler, who was a business partner uh, of the late Tom Gilbert, uh, and also of Bob Mager and of Joe Harless. And I actually met and knew uh, three of the four of these people very well. I didn't know Gilbert very well. But, but Gilbert and Rumler had 
workshop materials that I was given in my first week on the job back in 1979. They were from 1972 because they've been practicing this from the 60s on. And that was to be, look at the outputs or what Gilbert called accomplishments, but that doesn't translate very well to my clients. So I always focused on what are the outputs that are produced? And those outputs are inputs downstream, either to an external customer or to an internal customer. But what is that output? What am I producing that I'm handing off to somebody or, or using for my next steps of the process? So beginning with the end in mind, what is the output? And then who are the stakeholders for that output? Uh, is it There's the downstream customer for sure, but there could be regulators who are concerned about that output. There could be the people that are concerned with safety in the organization. Our management is concerned with that. Our shareholders are concerned with that. Are we producing, are we spending $10 to produce a $9 output? You know, that's no good. You're losing a dollar every time. And so we, so there are various stakeholders for the output itself. And then there's the process that produces that. There's the human in the process. There's the infrastructure of the process. The human has knowledge and skills that they need. They need maybe physical, intellectual, psychological capabilities. Um, they need values, perhaps. And do we have the right person in that process? And do we have the process fully enabled? Uh, does it have the right data, tools, and equipment, uh, finances, is the culture and consequence system in tune with what we're trying to do? So it, it can get quite complex, but that's where we as instructional systems designer types or learning experience designers, when we look at the performance situation and if we're addressing a problem, we need to be able to dissect that performance situation, the performance context to determine whether or not all the right pieces are in place. And if there is not, it's a gap. And how do we solve that gap? But if we're addressing new hires, then yeah, we don't need to necessarily worry so much about that because new hires need to be trained. But if it's a problem that's driving the client's request, we need to understand you know, what's really going on and will addressing knowledge and skills solve the problem, address the opportunity appropriately? It may not. And therefore, we need to help steer our clients to a better path, a more uh, appropriate intervention. Perhaps they simply need to re-engineer their process or they need to make sure that the data that people are working with is current or that the tools that they that they use are e efficient and effective. So there's, there's many aspects to performance and we get called in because there's a problem and we're asked to address that. And, you know, one of my biases is that we shouldn't uh, push back on the request, we shouldn't challenge it, we should accept it, we should clarify the request, and we should conduct analysis so that we can generate the analysis data that will inform the client as to whether or not addressing knowledge and skills is going to address their problem adequately. Um, and sometimes it will, and sometimes, most of the time, most likely it won't, unless, of course, it's a new hire situation where people need to be trained to do their jobs. Uh, I, this actually comes up a lot in, in the course that we run. Um, can you share, uh, and again, I know this is completely un, un, uh, you know, unprepared. Can you share an ex example where um, fixing a process um, was the solution instead of um, you know, building an entire course? Well, yeah. So um, I've, in some of the analyses that I've done, uh, I usually work with teams of master performers and other subject matter experts and perhaps supervisors and sometimes novice performers. So one of the things we do is we model performance. And some people might do process mapping or something like that, but the idea is to get that all out. And uh, what I learned from the late Gary Rumler very early on in my career is that he would start with, so what's the pro you know, th what's the output? And then what's the process? Is there one? Oh, there isn't. <laughs> that could be the source of your problem. You'll have tremendous variation in your product, your output, if you have tremendous variation in your process. So a lot of the, like the quality movement used to be uh, called uh, variability reduction before it was called total quality management. At least that's what the quality people told me back in 1981. So sometimes there is no process and we need to fix that. 
and perhaps everybody knows well enough how to do things. They just need a standard process that people can follow that's flexible enough and as rigorous as it needs to be, but it may, may need to be some somewhat flexible as well. Um, and so addressing the, the process uh, might be the key issue. Uh, it be, and if there is a process and nobody's following it, well, that's another question. If we have a standard process, why aren't people following it? And what I learned from Rumbler is that if it's not the process, look to the consequence system because the consequence system might be out of whack, uh, might not be aligned with what we want. And one classic example is that we give our best workers more work to do than anybody. Eventually they figure that out and they'll start slacking off and making mistakes just so that they get a reasonable amount of work and don't get overburdened compared to everybody else. Especially if we're not doing any pay differential for them for their extra efforts and all that. So, but sometimes it's the data and information that people have. I've, I've had experts tell me that in the current process, if they took the data that they had to do their work, they would fail every time. They knew that there was more current data on somebody's desk. And I had a, a master performer tell me in, front, in a room full of other master performers, well, I would go to so-and-so's desk and I would stand on it. I would actually climb on a chair, get on their top of their desk and stand on their desk until they gave me exactly what I wanted because I knew they had it and they just didn't, weren't, you know, in a hurry to give it to me. They were busy doing other things, but, you know, I'm not going to allow that to happen. <laughs> Master performers are like that. Um, <laughs> but, but so the person literally did. And so all you would have to do after that would be walk in the room and the other person would scramble to get the data and give it to them. And, so, but that's not a very efficient process. And so when our, my clients heard this story, uh, they didn't believe it. And they had to go check and find out, yeah, it was true. Uh, they had to go and put consequences on that person that was holding that data and change their process and their consequence system for getting the most current data to the people that needed it because it was wrecking havoc on the productivity of that other group. And so... You know, so we need to look at the things in it as a system. We need to you know, approach things with systems thinking to look at what's this performance context? How does it work as a system? What are all the pieces that are ideally in place? They don't have to be perfect. They have to be good enough for the process to work. And when something is out of whack, how do we re-engineer that in some way? Now, so sometimes we have to look at our process and think, well, there's another process that feeds our process and the problem is over there. And so we have to go to that process and apply whatever it is necessary to make that process work appropriately and enable our targeted process. That's a brilliant answer. I, I'm going to, I think I'm going to cut this bit out and put that into the, we have a, um, a little uh, part of the course where we introduce uh, Mega's flow, flow diagram and um, and a point we try to make in uh, make early is that, you know, even though you have an idea for course in your head, um, you know, putting the cart in front of the horse isn't the most appropriate um, solution. Sometimes it's you know fixing the process, uh, which is exactly. And there are many flow charts just like that one. Mager had one. Gilbert and Rumler had one. Joe Harless had thirteen smart questions. Uh, Jim and Dana Gaines Robinson had. Uh, in their Zap the Gap book and uh, uh, course where they had uh, a model. So there are many diagnostic tools like this. And my recommendation to people is get all of them that you can and make them your own. You know, adopt what you can, adapt the rest. I've been doing that my entire career. I've taken things, borrowed things from many, many different people to create something that worked for me in my context. Um and that spoke the language of my customers, because sometimes we use strange language that doesn't really communicate to our customers what it's all about. But so we have to be careful about those kinds of things. That's awesome. Uh, I, I've actually, I don't know if you've noticed or if seen it, but um, Kathy Moore uh, released a, a, an interactive flowchart um, a, a few weeks ago, I think, where people can um, I haven't used it myself, but people can click on a bunch of buttons and then it'll <laughs> kind of automate that, which I think is really cool. It, it kind of forces you to, to, to consider each of those options. Um, yeah. Uh, um, Guy, I, I think I have one final question for you. 
um, and this I'll, I'll cut and put at the beginning. But if you could just um, quickly introduce yourself um, with a, a quick overview and, and some of the, the like the projects or some of your, your background, that, the things you've worked on before. Okay, well, my name is Guy Wallace. I'm a uh, performance analyst and an instructional architect. I've uh, been in the business since 1979. I became an external consultant in 1982. I've had uh, over 80 Fortune 500 clients, and I've worked for the military. I've worked for NASA. Uh, I've worked for some firms in uh, Germany and in the Netherlands. Um, my specialty, I'm all about performance-based instruction. And by instruction, I mean both uh, job aids, or what we nowadays call performance support, and training, which nowadays we might call learning experiences. Um, but so I've always been focused on the performance, um, and I, I, I've defined that uh, already, or I, I will in this uh, in this video. And I think that it's important for everybody to focus on the performance and enable that through whatever means, and if the means that will enable performance, don't include any instruction, job aids or training, performance support or learning experience, then we need to guide our clients to the root causes of their issues so that they can address them appropriately. Uh, Guy, I, I just want to say finally, thank you so much for, for your time. Um, it is uh, an absolute pleasure to talk to someone who's uh, been such a trailblazer um, in the instructional design, instructional systems design space. Um, and uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to share um, your knowledge about um, social learning and instructional design um, in general. Thank you for inviting me.